Welcome to the Idea to Value podcast, where in every episode we highlight the latest insights into creativity and innovation from experts around the world. I'm your host, Nick Skillicorn. I care about the evidence behind what makes ideas happen, and I've already helped thousands of people just like you through my unique insights into recent scientific findings of how creativity works. I also show you how to turbocharge innovation programs so they finally deliver on the value and ideas you've been struggling to execute. Get your free training on how creativity can be improved by registering now at www.ideatovalue.com. Now let's get on with today's episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another podcast interview with the innovation and creativity experts out there. Today, we've got Peter Cook with us, and Peter's been doing work with Virgin and other large companies around the world around the concepts of creativity and innovation. Nice to have you, Peter. Good morning to you, Nick. Um, Peter, why don't you give us a quick background about uh, the sort of work that you've been doing with Virgin recently? And I understand that you've uh, also written, uh, written a book about innovation, creativity, and uh, especially the sort of musical-based work that you do on those lines? I do I do a lot of work with larger companies, not particularly Virgin, but I did win a prize from Richard Branson for my work on leadership. That led to uh, getting an interview uh, from him for the book, which I just happen to have here. <laughs> Convenient. Leading innovation, creativity and enterprise. So um, I go to companies and do two things with them, really. Uh, sometimes they've got a, a problem that keeps them awake at night, what I call a wicked problem, something which is either they're too close to and can't see the wood for the trees, or indeed it's complex and they require an expert to help them untangle the uh, the wickedness. Uh, so I sort of lock them up for a few days. Uh, it could be like a new product uh, concept or something that they're struggling with that's really intractable. Uh, examples have been I've done work for Pfizer where they're looking for uh, patent extension ideas for their products and obviously things like searching the future and uh, trying to work out where to position yourself in a, in a volatile world are the sorts of wicked problems that typically come up from organisations. So part of my work is quite serious and uh, that sort of you know, tends to be long term stuff. Um, but equally, uh, people sometimes you know, just want an injection of some uh, bit of inspiration or excitement. And so I have this other side where I blend ideas from business with uh, similar concepts from music. So I cross over business and music, and that's what I call the Academy of Rock. Um, I've written about seven books, and some of them have got strange titles like Sex, Leadership, and Rock and Roll. <laughs> to me, there's no sex in the book. Um, but they're, they're, they're metaphors for things like relationships, motivation, and doing the hard work. So I do also cross over work uh, with, with musical ideas, which makes the pills go down much, much better. And when you say the pills go down, what are you talking about? Are these like difficult truths to swallow or what sort of things? Sometimes they are provocative truths. Um, I've just come back from Italy and Germany doing some master classes and uh, some keynotes over there. Um, the, the seminars, you know, it's always much easier to swallow a difficult pill if it's sugar coated. Um, and so I think, you know, and you can d deal with quite difficult concepts using music. So, for example, I, I talk to leaders about listening. You know, what, what's difficult about that? Actually, quite a lot of time there's a big difficulty with hearing ideas that you don't agree with. So I use the concept of musical dissonance and cognitive dissonance in psychology. In music, musical dissonance is when two notes sort of jar together. And you can make beautiful music out of such things uh, if you know what you're doing. Uh, classic example is... Uh, sort of the beginning of Painted Black has two, two notes that are just too close together to, to sort of, uh, and that they sort of interfere with one another in physics terms. So in music, you can make a fortune out of dissonance. In business, cognitive dissonance is when everyone smiles at meeting, appears to agree, and then goes somewhere else and, you know, swears about the, the other mm -hmm. participant. And that costs billions. One good example of that is Pfizer themselves had a product for inhalable insulin some years ago. The chief executive told everyone, because it was their only product in the pipeline, that if anyone spoiled the launch, you know, read his lips, uh, there would be trouble. And nobody told him that the inhaler that they developed was about the size of a fire extinguisher. Oh, God. It was just not a convenient. Everyone knew that it was not going to work. A small child could have, in fact, told them. But he said, I don't want to hear so listening and leadership is terribly expensive if you don't do it well, particularly those ideas that are dissonance from your 
own mindset. So I, I do introduce sort of provocative ideas, but I think the music helps them be received better. And how can you actually uh, take that from just an abstract concept like listen better? How, how can you get them to actually do that? So during these seminars, how do you teach someone to get over these issues? Well, there's no one hour seminar in the world that ever completes that cycle in the time. I've never been to an hour that's been so brilliant that it's transformed my life. So usually there has to be then some of the more traditional things working through with people in organisational development terms, in coaching. Pra I mean, practice is another musical concept which managers don't understand as well as musicians do, the 10,000 hours of practice. You do need to put in the work. Listening to ideas outside of your thing is hard for all of us. So I think people do need to practice, and an hour is never enough, quite. But with coaching and support, that can help. It's quite interesting you mentioned the 10,000-hour figure, because this is something that, especially in the management circles, is thrown out quite a lot. Mm. Uh, but uh, a couple of months ago, I wrote an article, uh, which was the people who did the original study, which was popularized by Malcolm Gladwell, mm. who essentially told the world, practice for 10,000 hours, and you'll become a master. They said he completely misinterpreted that. And what's important instead is deliberate practice. And yes. this comes to the concept of really thinking about and being serious with yourself about what do I actually need to improve? And therefore, how do I go and actually push myself beyond my comfort levels and into the better territory? You can't fault, Eric, uh, you can't fault Gladwell and, and Tom Peters for sort of summarizing Ericsson's work because it was deeply academic. And there has been some criticism and said it's not 10,000 hours. I, I don't actually think that matters too much. But I meet regularly musicians who are, you know, struggling. They've been struggling for more than 10,000 hours. They haven't yeah. got basic skill. And there's no amount of practice will make them into Nigel Kennedy. <laughs> so I think you have to almost have a, you know, a, a basic ability. And then practice will make you better, undoubtedly. So uh, this idea of dis uh, dissonance uh, is one thing you'd take from music that you can help people understand leadership and innovation better. Are there any other concepts that you can take from music to uh, the boardroom? I think things like the, the idea of flow, which was proposed by Mihaly, and I can't say the rest. <laughs> uh, it's, I, I, I always struggle with it myself, but uh, the guy who summarised all of the great artists' work in his great book, I prefer called to, Creativity. Yeah, I prefer to, words, to use the words personal mastery, because that was from Peter Senge, who's much easier to say. <laughs> and for me, it's a parallel idea that uh, great leaders and great musicians have real mastery. And if you are in flow then everything is effortless. Um, you see this happen in jazz music or in all sorts of music, but often in jazz you can see people uh, looking like it's effortless. It's really annoying for the audience because they think that if they just try the same thing, then they will be you know, John Coltrane or, or so on. I interviewed uh, quite a number of people who are musicians over the course of the last few years, and some of it has appeared in the books, particularly Prince's uh, saxophonist, Marcus Anderson, who really recognised that state of flow. This is almost magical thing. And he said it, it is really about, you know, it relies on the whole group to be sort of working together towards the aim and can't necessarily be conjured up like a tap. Uh, also recently talking to Eda Nielsen, uh, Prince's bass player, same story. She's an absolute brilliant musician. Um, but, you know, you need. She, I think there are certain things you can do that encourage a state of flow, but you can't, it's a probabilistic function, I think. You can't ever guarantee it, rather, like some managers wish you to turn creativity off and on. like a force. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Uh, and the, this idea of flow, um, one of the things that I always talk about with my clients is it's, it's an easy concept to talk about, but it relies so much on the whole team working together. And as you said, towards the same goal. And that's based a lot on trust. And it also, um, it requires them to be allowed to get into the state of flow, allowed to start trying out new things. And uh, uh, my, my background is also partially in improvisation, and that's where I get that uh, sort of concept from. Uh, do you have a view on that? I think forcing it is often a bad place to be. I think sometimes if, you're, if I am uh, have enough time, uh, I, will, I like to sort of centre myself before I'm playing music or indeed delivering a keynote. Usually what's happening when you're going to do a conference is people are putting your time mic on. They want mm -hmm. they can we do an interview as well while you're trying to think, what am I about to do? 
And I, was, I think it's exactly the same as people going on stage. You know, you watch these backstage things and there's hundreds of people, you know, flying around the artist trying to do little things, which actually is, you know, you have to be quite centred to let that happen. Uh, yeah, and then you, you see the great artists are usually the calmest ones in those moments where they've done it a hundred times and they, they know the spiel and they can take away those distractions and focus on what needs to be done. I think so I think actually having that good preparation is is necessary and a little bit of time to work on yourself um, and, and sometimes you can do it while you're sticking microphones up through your uh, t-shirt and <laughs> stuff it's like on autopilot but I think actually being centered matters um, whatever that means but I know what it means but I think uh, the, the experts disagree about how you do it. You know, deep breathing isn't necessarily the only way to do it <laughs> But sometimes so people do this stuff in a, in a chaotic situation when there's hundreds of people sort of wanting little bits of you. Uh, but expert performers know, as you say, how to do that on autopilot. Mm. Um, you, uh, we, we mentioned, we were speaking uh, briefly before the uh, interview and you mentioned specifically around improvisation, something I hadn't really thought about previously, which was purposeful in, uh, improvisation. Yeah. What, what do you mean by that? Well, I contrast sort of what you might call orchestral management, where someone there's someone's got a bat on, they know all the all the notes. Other people's job is to rather like making a Ford car, to simply simply assemble the car. In this case, yeah. to play those notes accurately without too much interpretation. Not a lot of room for improvisation in the average orchestra, but in jazz, um, if we take the other extreme in free form jazz, everyone is endlessly diverging, and that. That I don't mean that kind of improvisation because that is your Hewlett Packard, two men in a shed startup situation. Mm -hmm. Endless divergence can be very expensive for business. It may be very good when you're trying to find your focus, but I think the structured improvisation is the place where organisations can learn most. And of course, rock music usually has a space for soloists. Everyone essentially can be a leader. Um, it's not as chaotic as you know freefall jazz so you can study things like jazz and rock and even in jazz you can see there are certain structures so in jazz you'll often see people doing this which means play the head which is the motif for the people listening to the podcast uh, peter was just tapping the top of his head <laughs> oh sorry yes yes so um tapping the top of your head is like go to the head which is the head of the piece the motif of the song um so there are structures actually surprisingly in jazz because jazz is a more complex form of music indeed the more complexity one has the more one needs structure but the structures are implicit in those forms of music rather than they're not often written down on sheet music like they are in classical i always like the uh, the way that you talk to jazz artists um, everyone assumes that they just were born with this ability to play the the right notes unexpectedly at the right time but um, what what you learn about people who improvise either in jazz or theater or uh, uh, comedy or anything is they still need to go through the basic uh, training and practice mm. to learn the structures within which you can improvise. Because if you just start improvising, if you just assume it's a mathematical thing and improvisation is completely random, then uh, things are not going to mesh together. And it's only when people are working within the same box, as you say, uh, that the improvised end result actually ends up being appealing and worthwhile. Absolutely, yes. Um, I think um, yeah, you can have freeform jazz and all forms of improvisation that are sort of inner directed, but you might not have an audience. And in, in business, you can have endless creativity and, uh, and you may not have a customer. <laughs> So, you know, I, I talk to a lot of startup companies and they say, I've got this brilliant idea. And you say, have you told anyone? Oh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm... I don't want anyone to steal my idea. Fermenting. And please sign this non-disclosure agreement. Well, there's that as well. But also they haven't exposed it to the market. And a good band has an audience. A good business has a customer. And, you know, it's the sort of better mousetrap syndrome sometimes with entrepreneurs. Oh, this is so brilliant. It's so cool. I can't explain it to anyone. And then they're surprised that nobody wants it. Yeah, you yeah, have exactly. to simplify, you know, in particularly in a busy world, to help people understand complexity, and that uh, that really is a function of leadership. Really, is to make things simple, simple without dumbing them down. Exactly. It's interesting you bring up the better mousetrap example uh, because when you talk about innovation, 
uh, and when I speak to the other experts out there on innovation and my clients, um, there, there's always this slight divergence between different people talking about innovation in different ways. And uh, what we're sort of, sort of heading towards, I believe, is a definition where the word value is the most critical thing. Mm -hmm. And it's about delivering value, not just to the producer or the uh, inventor of the mousetrap or the um, company doing this work. It's also for the end customer. Yeah, I mean, innovation is the commercialization of an idea in a way that somebody either wants or needs. Um, commercialization in the public sector, of course, is, doesn't mean profit. It means something with purpose. But nonetheless, there has to be something there that at the end of the day somebody wants or needs, or sometimes both, of course. Uh, some social good if it's a, a private sector thing and, and obviously some combining your passion. It's this Daniel Pink thing, I think, of combining purpose, passion and profit. And Richard Branson and Virgin are a very good example of that. Uh, they, they do make a profit, but they actually use some of that profit to do some social good, which yeah, drives the purpose of the company, really. Is that uh, one of the things you talk about when you talk about innovation specifically, or, or what are the main highlights that uh, your seminars talk about when it comes to innovation? Well, I, I did actually use that example. I talked about uh, how Richard manages Virgin or, or leads Virgin and, and what the Virgin Way is last week when I did the seminar in Italy. And my summing up point, well, I said that, that Virgin itself was an epitomization of Pink's idea of passion, uh, purpose and profit, really. So I did use Daniel Pink's... Uh, I often combine what academics say with what pragmatism say, says, because some people in the audience want a theory, some people want to know what someone does with that theory, and the music somehow is the sort of glue between those things. Perfect. Uh, Peter, we're just coming up to the end now, but uh, what I'd like uh, the, the, the interviewees to... Uh, leave the audience with is one sort of actionable piece of insight, something they can take away from today to take themselves to the next level, uh, either on the subject of becoming more creative or more innovative. So uh, what would you say there? Well, creativity in business is the thinking of both novel and appropriate ideas. So this differs from artistic creativity where you can sit in an attic for 20 years and wait for the light to come right. So your, your creativity is not just novel, it must be apt and useful for the, the enterprise that you're working in. Perfect. Thank you, Peter. Um, what's the name of your book again? Uh, Leading Innovation, Creativity and Enterprise and Music of Business is another one. And you can find them all on the, the websites, which is uh, Human Dynamics. If you put in Peter Cook, Human Dynamics or Peter Cook Academy of Rock on Google, you find me. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you. Today's episode was made possible by members of our premium Deep Creativity Training Program. For less than the price of half a candy bar per day, you too can get world-exclusive daily exercises which push your creativity past its comfort barrier to make you better able to generate ideas in all aspects of your life and work. Invest in yourself now by going to www.ideatovalue.com slash deepcreativity and using coupon code PODCAST for 25% off your first order. And don't forget that if you found this episode interesting, to like and share it, and to leave us a review in your favorite podcast player. See you again in the next episode.